Hey, good Wednesday evening once again. We welcome you to another midweek class discussion. We are continuing in the book of Romans and uh, my uh, distinguished friend here looks very uh, formal. I did not get the memo that this was a formal occasion today. Chuck. Well, I dressed to go to church and you <laughs> apparently dressed to go fishing. <laughs> You're a fisher of men, John Phillips. I like these fishing shirts. Uh, They're comfortable. In all, in all uh, clarity, I came from a funeral, and I was too lazy to change clothes, and it felt like I looked fairly good, so I thought I'd just go uh, with uh, it for it's a few a good, hours. It's a good look for yeah. you, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep things it's on, on the a higher plane It's on today. the sale rack at Dillard's. So, hey, you know, you know you're looking good. Can't do better than that. We are continuing in the book of Romans, and uh, one thing before we get into chapter 11 this evening, we do want to... Uh, remind you, we've said this before, but certainly you know you are entitled to a Bible answer to any Bible question that you might have. Anything that we discuss, anything that we teach, preach for that matter, you have a right to question and we'll endeavor to give you a, a Bible answer, book, chapter, and verse to your Bible question. And as we go through the book of Romans, as, as you've said many times, uh, Romans is challenging. Not the easiest section of scripture to go through. Peter said our brother Paul writes some things that are hard to understand. Almost assuredly, he was, he was thinking talking about, about what we're talking about in the next couple of weeks. Romans uh, is difficult in general. Romans 11 is difficult especially. Yeah. And uh, Paul's getting into the question of the remnant of Israel, mm -hmm. the grafting in of the Gentiles, God's ultimate plan and how... Uh, his plan before the foundation of the world is played out. Mm. This is really some complicated stuff. It uh, is. Um, theologically, um, uh, just challenging mentally to stay up with Paul. And so suffice it to say, if you have any questions for Chuck, for yes. myself, um, get on the website, use that uh, format, send us a text message, uh, call, leave a message if you want, however you want to do that. But we will endeavor to give you a Bible answer to your Bible uh, question. But for tonight, we are in chapter 11 in the book of Romans. Romans, that's right. Uh, beginning with verse 1, we find these words. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not that what the scripture saith in Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace... Then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According to as is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Hmm. Let's go back to the beginning and hmm. figure out what it is that Paul's trying to get across. He's, he's saying something pretty he's, significant. He's saying something very significant. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2, the very first time the gospel was presented. We tend to focus on a couple of things in Acts chapter 2. You've got the Holy Spirit showing right. up. You've got uh, Peter using that key to unlock the doors mm -hmm. of the kingdom through obedience to the gospel. Mm -hmm. You've got 3,000 men about being baptized that day. Yeah. Folks coming into the church, a, a, a smashing debut for the church of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now here's a couple of other things that sometimes we don't look at. It's estimated that that crowd on Pentecost was upwards of 100,000 people. Or more, yeah. So 3,000 is a great number of people who accepted baptism. But a small percentage of that crowd. But a very small percentage against the whole thing. So mm -hmm. Paul begins Romans 11 looking at that. He said, so does this mean that God has rejected his people? A clear reference to the fact that by this time, mm -hmm. probably... 
you know, mid first century, maybe the year 55, 60, 62, somewhere, Some, somewhere, somewhere there. there, about the first fifth, sixth decade into the, to, to the century. Most of the Jews have not followed Jesus. They've not accepted him as the son of God. They've mm -hmm. not accepted him as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So the picture is rather bleak at this point that it doesn't look as if these people are going to be in communion with God. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. So uh, Paul is speaking, uh, not in code, but certainly some of the phrases that he's using is gonna strike a chord with his Israelite brethren. Yes. And basically That's he right. is kind of catching their ear once again. It's interesting too, the juxtaposition of how Paul will kind of go point, counterpoint. He's on to the Gentiles. Oh wait, he's back on the Jews. Mm -hmm. The Jews are in his corner. Wait, they're, they're, they're offended by what he said. The Gentiles are happy. <laughs> it's back and forth. And I think that's by design, he's trying to kind of cover all his bases. So is God, has God rejected the nation of Israel? Paul says, God no, forbid. God forbid by no means. He said, I'm of the nation of Israel, okay? I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, okay? I'm a son of Abraham as well. So no, he hasn't done that. But then he brings up something, and this is fascinating yeah. to me. He says, I'll tell you what I'm thinking of right now. He says, it's like in the days of Elijah. Elijah is basically to the point, I'm done with this. Okay, I've given my whole life to try to call the people back to God. Most of them can't decide if they're <laughs> going to follow God, if they're going to follow the Baals. Are they with the Lord? Are they with uh, Ahab and, and his witchy wife, Jezebel? Jezebel? Okay, so what is it? And if you remember, after they win the smashing victory over the prophets of Baal, it looks as if he could not get any higher on, on the pinnacle of his career as yeah. a spokesman for God. And then the word comes from Jezebel. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if it's by this time mm -hmm. tomorrow your life is not like yeah. one of them. In other words, my fine little friend, I'm going to kill you. Hold that thought, Professor Monan, yes. because we're flying past uh, verse number two, and I've got a, a, a pretty yeah. important question here. Uh -huh. Uh, Paul says, God has not cast his people away, talking about the, the Jews, the seed of Abraham, the, the people according to promise, God's, God's own special people. And he says this at the end of that sentence, God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Mm -hmm. You got to spend a moment or two talking about this whole idea of foreknowledge and predestination, just so we make sure we understand. Well, that. what you have done is that you have given a foreshadowing mm -hmm. of what we're going to be talking about next week and in the week to come, because that is right. There is the idea of foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of election. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of predestination. predestination. For our purposes at this point, let's go ahead and say, God had been working on this for a long time. Since this was the not promise anything, came that's to right. Abraham, that's right. all of this was in the mind of yes. God. And so Paul is simply reminding them that God's no shorter than his word. He made a promise. When God makes a promise, it's better than money in the bank. He's going to do what he says. So he reminds them of that. And then mm. to further remind them, as you were yeah. saying, he brings up something that they would be very well familiar with, well, and that is some of the prophets. Elijah is ready. He basically says, God, kill me. I'm done. He does. I've wasted my life. None of this has mattered. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I'm no better than my forefathers. Take my life. He's singing And blues. the Lord basically says, Elijah, get a hold of yourself, okay? It, it is not as if it seems completely hopeless. Everybody's okay? abandoning you. No. Everyone hasn't abandoned I've got you. got 7,000. There are 7,000. <laughs> whose knees have not bowed to Baal. I've got them hidden away in caves. Yeah. You're not alone. By the way, go anoint Jehu, the next king, because I'm done with Ahab and his idiot wife. And tell go, Jezebel. You tell Jezebel, you want to go ahead and make threats, I'll make a threat. The dogs uh, will leave, lick up leave your those blood. Dogs alone. You want to make some threats? I got a threat for you, woman. So, and in Elisha's case, He's going to go ahead and pick up the mantle and he's going to follow in your footsteps. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't understand any of that, that's okay. Because here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I kind of feel like that. I feel like I'm swimming upstream. Most of my Jewish brethren have been disinterested in Jesus at this point. Yeah. Okay, And that breaks my heart because I want them to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, just as I do. Even though at this point they don't know. He said, now, just understand this. 
it's not as if people are going to be earning their way into the kingdom. Ah. It's still by grace, verses 5 and 6, and you can't get away from grace in the entire book of Romans or the entire New saga Testament. of mean, Christianity it's, it's or the rest of the New Testament. Now, look at verse 7 for just a minute. This is what we really need to get a hold of. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, ears that would not hear, down to this very day. Mm -hmm. Israel was looking for something, Paul says, that is, it is yet to find. Mm -hmm. They're looking for the Messiah. They haven't found him. You know why? Because he came and they missed him. They were looking in all of the wrong places, yeah. as the song says. Yeah. Now, a couple of other things here. The elect obtained it. We'll come back to that in the next couple of lessons. But the elect are those whosoever will. The non-elect are whosoever won't. Mm -hmm. So let's not get ahead of ourselves as our Calvinistic friends like to do. Mm -hmm. God's already picked out those who are going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Unconditionally. So if that's the case, then let's just fold up the tents and go do what we want because he's already decided who's going to hell and who's going to heaven. Yeah. And nothing you do is going to matter. So wow. why waste? One, one of several erroneous doctrines that are floating That's out right. there even to this day. I want to back up to verse 5 mm -hmm. as we kind of back into this. And Paul does something here, I think, that we've said all along. The Bible is as relevant as the front page news. But Paul is picking up on that as he's talking to these Jews about the fact that God still has uh, a plan for them, a remnant. Uh, he says, even so at this present time, there is also a remnant according to um, the election of grace. So when things seem so bad and when times seem so troubled that we think that the whole world is going to Hades in a handbasket, as the old saying goes, that idea mm -hmm. that God always has that remnant, I, I think that's an important concept that we sometimes think was only true for the, for the Jews or true back in that day. I think maybe that's a message that we need to hear in this present time. Well, let's de let's define it as we should. What is a remnant? A remnant is a a small portion, uh, a, a, a section, a piece. You know what a carpet remnant is? Carpet remnant, some they, leftover. Th that's something left over. Yeah. A remnant is a leftover. In other words, if God has got to use the leftovers, then so be it. <laughs> but guess what? This isn't new for God. God's been using the leftovers basically forever. Ever. Think about the story of Gideon. Yeah. They're getting ready to go into battle against the nation of Midian with 10,000 people. And Lord, yeah. I don't need 10,000. How many do you need? Eh, 300 or so. Mm -hmm. That'll be good. That was good for the Spartans, you know, at Thermopylae uh, the against the, oh my the Persians. We can do that. So in other words, God will use what he has on hand to accomplish the purpose that he has in mind. So here's where we are with this. So that remnant is a great idea. And that tells us today, and, and, and again, Thank you. you got all these folks today. You got some in the churches yeah. of Christ. We have people in this town. If we don't do X, Y, y and Z, Z that's it. the church will disappear. Church is on the it. decline. We're not doing it. It's know. like time out, Chris Weber. The church <laughs> is not going to disappear. No, you didn't. But yeah, I did. <laughs> Too soon? It's been, you know, 30 years. I'm just coming from you. Yeah, I'll take well, it. Okay. You, you were thinking it, so I went ahead and said it. Okay. If we don't have women preachers, if we don't have women serving the Lord's suppers, if we don't have monkeys riding unicycles, wow. giving out the fruit of the vine and taking up the collection, if we don't have uh, this, that, and the other, if we don't have a band, if we don't have a praise team, then everyone's going to leave. No, they're not. Yeah. Okay? And if they did, so what? Bigger is not always so what? better. Let me tell you, that idea of the remnant, God yes. always has his people, those who are willing to hold true to that which is written, to stand firm on the word of God. And so that's an important message, Chuck, it's a for, for it's, a, it's a huge message because we have a bunch of people mm. today, and they're as delusional as they can possibly be because they've bought into the notion that the church's survival depends on their marketing acumen and their cleverness. Yeah. It doesn't. The church de derives thrives and survives, and survives because of Christ. That's it. 
On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, Matthew 16. And so that's so, a good segue then to help us to understand the argument that Paul is making to the Jews. Hey, is your survival based on works, or is it by grace? That's it. And if you, since Paul is going back in history and saying, my situation right now is very analogous to, to the situation of Elijah. Mm -hmm. I feel outnumbered. <laughs> I feel outgunned. I feel outflanked. Guess what? <laughs> Jezebel's after you again. One person plus God equals a majority. Paul's yeah. saying that. So if God starts off with a remnant, if most of the people chase after some pipe dream, let them go. And it is according to, as it has you know, been written here, Paul gives a pretty good analogy of, as you're describing things of today, and in every age, we're not picking on anyone, but we're just saying the Bible is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. Paul says the problem is not that God is not doing his part. The problem is you've got eyes that will not see. You've got ears that will not hear. Mm. And so the problem is you, not God. Now let's think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of clauses within this sentence in, in verse 7. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained, but the, but the rest were hardened as it was written. <clears throat> God gave them a spirit of stupor. Mm -hmm. Think about what that might look like. Why did, the, why did the Jewish nation, when Jesus showed up, reject him? Well, what was the main reason, the obvious reason? He was not what they were, were looking, looking for. for. What were they looking uh, they for? They wanted a king like David, the glory days. They wanted someone tall and handsome they wanted like an, Solomon. They wanted an Alexander the Great who was going to come in and, the Romans out of power. And, and run the Persians <laughs> into the ocean. They wanted a leader who was going to go ahead and restore Mis Israel to her former glories. Mm -hmm. They wanted a David. Mm -hmm. They wanted a Saul. At this point, they might have settled for a Herod. We want someone who's going to be a military leader. Okay, guess what? My kingdom is not of this world. John 18, verse 36. They weren't looking for the right thing. Yeah. So, as a result, their hearts were hardened against Jesus. So much to the point. Think about what the Gospels tell us in many places. In John 9, when the man was born blind, is given sight by Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're pretty much convinced that this guy's never been able to see. Now he can see, and they're like, look, we're still going to find him, and we're going to find Jesus. Yeah. We're going to kill them both because this is getting out of control. They don't care to follow well, truth at this Jesus point. Jesus said it best on many occasions when he would teach about the kingdom of heaven, and he would say something to the effect, those that have ears to hear, yes. let them hear. And the Jews were like, they don't uh, want to hear. We don't want to hear. They don't want to hear. That's a very <laughs> significant point. And we come back to this phrase about being hardened, okay? Mm -hmm. Israel is hardened because Jesus was not what they wanted to see. Therefore, they weren't going to consider any of the claims about himself, even though he told them, if you don't believe in me, at least believe in the miracles themselves. Mm -hmm. We don't want to believe in the miracles. No. We want something else. Go all the way back to the Old Testament. I've been asked this question so many times, it's just rather startling. When God hardened Pharaoh's heart, uh, it makes God look like a tyrant and make him look really unreasonable because God hardens the man's heart. And yeah. then when he doesn't let Israel go, then God punishes, punishes him, him for, for letting him did. go. No. You're looking at this the wrong way. Here's, here's the right way to look at this. When it says God hardened his heart or God hardened Israel, mm -hmm. God is allowing circumstances to exist that could be interpreted this way, yeah. or they could be interpreted that way. Think about this. When Moses and Aaron show up before Pharaoh and says, Hear the Lord, let my people go. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh's like, eh, don't know the Lord, don't know who he is, neither will I let the people go. And he's like, you're going to reconsider pretty soon. Yeah. So he stretches out the staff, turns the Nile to blood. Okay. Oh, I've sinned, I'm going to let the people go. He mm -hmm. waits a while. But now, then... here's what's fascinating. Okay. Then his magicians can kind of uh -huh. imitate the same thing, so now nah, it's no big deal. Uh -huh. Well, what happens when the river turns to blood? All the frogs jump out of the water, so now the land's overrun with frogs. Okay, yeah. then the frogs die, and then you got the flies, and then you got the boils, and then you got the. Okay, here's, here's the thing without going through a whole litany <laughs> of the Ten Commandments. You only got three more left to go. One commandment falls, falls into the, the next, and into the next and into the next. And Pharaoh, 
an educated man, is looking at this saying, wait a second, the, fly, the, the, the flies were caused by all the piles of dead frogs, and then this was caused by this, and that was caused by that. And here, okay, circumstances existed. And Pharaoh said, I have an alternate explanation by how these things happen. I don't think it was God. I think it's natural phenomenon. Now, go to the, the present day. Yep. We've got some of the smartest people in the world that know the movements of the heavenly bodies. They know science. They know everything. And if you ask a good portion of these people, there is no God. Yep. Well, how, why do you say that? Well, because we don't need God to explain the universe. Well, what do you mean? Well, it just happened, and that's what all, all that there is. And God is just a fantasy that we created to yeah. explain a bunch of stuff that we didn't used to understand seems as a people, but now we understand. Far-fetched, yeah. seems implausible. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Monan, surely God would not. But Paul explains all of this that's right. in chapter 1. He, he talks he, about God gave them uh -huh, over. Uh -huh. uh, God let them kind of go to the natural end of their proclivity, and this is what happened. Uh, they had that reprobate mind, and so I think the same thing happens in every age. Exactly. People are determined to, 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 to march in this direction, and God says, you know what, if you are bound and determined to do that, have at it. But isn't it wonderful that God always has that faithful remnant? And that's the point that Paul, I believe, is making now. Those phrases, God hardened their thinking. God gave them over. Yes. God created in them a spirit of, of stupor. Delusion. That's simply delusion. That's simply a way of saying that you've raised up a generation of people or an individual here or a person there that says, I've got a more plausible explanation than God. I've got a better plan of going forward than God. Now, you don't think we see this on many, many fronts today? We've decided today God made them male and female. No, mm, no, we've got mm. 146 different genders. Mm. Really? Really? Okay, the, the recent Supreme Court justice, you know, what's a woman? Well, I'm not a biologist. Well, you're not a, So you don't know what a man and what a woman is? It depends is? I mean, on what the know. meaning of the word is, is, And Chuck. no, it doesn't, because <laughs> it, it, what it is is there's a man, there's a woman, okay? We've decided that two women would be better than a man and a woman, or two men would be better. Okay, do you see my point? God has hardened people, and he's allowed them to think, if you got a better plan than I do, have at it. Go follow listen, the plan. Listen, listen to it once again. As it is written, God have given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they not can't, would won't see, not see, ears that they should not hear, unto this day. Now that day was Paul's day in the first century. But down the tunnel of time, I think the relevance of the scriptures for us, and one of the reasons why Romans is such an important book, is that a lot of these things are still in effect. Oh God is still allowing people to have Absolutely. the freedom of will and choice that if they choose to reject him, he's going to let them do that. But don't you uh, make any mistake about it that God is still going to be sitting on the throne at judgment time and holding them accountable to these things. I'm finishing up a brand new <laughs> book uh, called Reconstruction, The Death of Free Speech by playwright and author David Mamet. Mm. Mamet's Jewish. Mamet has looked at the claims of Jesus and says, I think that there's something to this. Mm -hmm. I think Jesus was special. I would love to be able to have my sins forgiven and to follow him, but my religion will not allow it. He said that. My blood ran cold. I'm like, look, yeah. you follow the truth wherever the truth leads. But, if, well, my religion won't allow it. Or I believe X instead of Y. God will harden you. God will give you over. God will give you the spirit of stupor. You've got to make the decision to follow the truth, whether it's the truth about the creation of the universe. Right the truth about the identity of Jesus, the truth about the best way to live your life and what code and, and, and what a system of morality you're going to follow. You've got to follow this. God's not going to force you to do it. But if you decide, I've come up with a better system, have at it, Hoss. Yeah. That's your business. God's God, not, God's not God going to stop allow. you from doing it. He'll allow it, but God but will hold you day, accountable. Thank you, for that. sir. That's the yeah. thing. The consequences are there. Uh, David says, and, and Paul is quoting uh, their, their charming prince and golden king, David. David said, let their table be made a snare. The things mm. that they choose mm. to, to feast on um, and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. And so 
Paul is really reasoning with them from things that they would understand, as David has said, as some of the former prophets have said, you're going down a pathway that's going to lead to destruction. And I think this is the challenge for our age, Chuck, as you have said. God will let you uh, follow the crowd, go down that road, mm -hmm. but in the end, there is destruction. I think um, a lot about uh, people may not remember uh, the Reverend Jim Jones. You remember that name? Guyana, San yeah. People's Temple, San Francisco. He didn't start out saying, hey, I'm going to take you over here in the mm -hmm. desert, uh, desert, out in the jungle, and your bodies are going to be bloat out there in the sun. No, he told them, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to start a new society. Everything's going to be lovely and mm -hmm. peaceful and great. How did that turn out? Not too good. Yeah. And so every age we see that same cycle of things happening, perhaps not to that extent, but anytime you deviate from those things that are written and true, anytime you begin to move in a direction that's different from what God has ordained, you can rest assured there's trouble to come. There was a famous phrase that uh, our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, liked to use. And he would ask a person, he said, how many legs does a dog have if you call a tail a leg? <laughs> and the person invariably say, well, five. He said, no, no. four. Calling a doesn't tail a leg so. <laughs> doesn't make it a leg, okay? That's and good. that's the thing here. God is calling us to follow his truth. Yeah. He's not going to force us to do it. He's not going to compel us to do it. And he will allow circumstances to exist that will cause some people to think they've found a way to build a better mousetrap. Hmm. Well, you can do that, but in your heart of hearts, you know that you're not going to come up with a better plan, with a better system than God has come up with. So Amen. in next week's lesson, part two in Romans chapter 11, we will pick up on this. But Paul is setting the stage here saying, right now we've got a situation with Israel that is at a critical stage. Yep. Okay, so what is God going to do? What was his plan? You, you brought it up before. Yep. Since he foreknew this, what was God working at even before we arrived on the scene? We'll answer that question next week. Stay tuned. Lead us in a prayer, John. You bet. Gracious Father, we are truly thankful for uh, this day, every opportunity that we have to uh, live life a little better, to draw a little closer to you. We just uh, give you thanks and praise for allowing us the privilege. And as we study uh, these truths that are written in your word, Father, help us to be attentive uh, hearers, listeners, as we study these truths. Help us, Father, to apply them to our lives that one day, uh, if we are faithful, we can hear you say, well done. Father, we pray for those under the sound of my voice who are going through times of difficulty, sickness, illness, whatever it might be. Father, we pray that you would be merciful unto them, um, strengthen them, heal them. If it be your holy will, return uh, each of us to a reasonable portion of our health and strength. And Father, we are especially mindful of those who um, are going through times of bereavement. Father, we just pray that you would give them comfort, and give them peace as only you can. Be with each of us as we strive to live for you day by day. Forgive us, and give us a home in heaven with you in the end. And this is our prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.